Today, uh, we're, we're looking at John Stewart Mill. And Mill is coming after Bentham. And I want to give you just a little bit of background about their, their relation to each other, because that fits in with the first part of what we're looking at today. Um, so John Stuart Mill is John Mill's son. There are two philosophers, John Stuart Mill, the son, John Mill, the father. And John Mill was a friend of uh, Jeremy Bentham. And John Mill actually decided to incorporate that into his parenting style and the family life. So John Stuart Mill is like the first generation after Bentham being raised in a utilitarian household. Um, and he, you know, like a lot of people coming in the second wave of a movement, um, he's doing something a little bit different than the first wave do. The first wave of any given movement of, of ideas, they come up with the ideas, right? And they, they want to fit everything into those ideas. And quite often, they, they attract a lot of attention. Bentham tried to reform the British legal system. He had some, some effect on it. Um, some of them good, some of them depending on how you, how you view uh, penology and the development of prisons, perhaps not quite so good. But um, overall, good. And utilitarianism came on the scene, and now it's a legitimate moral philosophy. It sort of brought together a lot of different kinds of ways of thinking that were out there at the time, but nobody had given a name to. Um, sort of like how, you know, you know, when a new political party arises, or a new movement in music or art arises, what, what happens is there's already stuff going on, and then somebody comes up with a name and a couple concepts, and now everybody can, can fit into it. What happens in the second step after that? Usually people start raising criticisms. And Bentham, his, his way of trying to deal with all the possible criticisms, this is part of what makes him a little bit boring to read, I think all of you found, is come up with enumerative lists, you know, one, two, three, to cover everything, right? Um, that's one way to do it. It's not the most interesting way to do it, and sometimes you end up in, invariably leaving something out and you might not be entirely satisfied with what Bentham gave you. Mill is coming after him, and Mill can actually see all the criticisms coming up around him. He's living this out. And so he's a little bit better situated to make some improvements on utilitarianism. And the, the most important um, improvement he makes is the shift away from quantitative, just calculating pleasures and pains on sort of an even basis, like something like a balance sheet, to also incorporating uh, qualitative distinctions between pains and pleasures. Um, another thing that he's going to do is he's going to respond to, and this is, he does this in other places besides utilitarianism, he's going to respond to some of the major criticisms that are being made of utilitarian moral theory. And I put those up here on the board, the ones that are in chapters one and two of uh, utilitarianism. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about why he thinks this is an important thing to do. So we've looked now at how many different moral theories? About five or six major moral theories this far in the semester. You notice they talk about a lot of the same stuff, don't they? And with those application assignments you figured out, they're not all going to see a situation the same way. They're going to emphasize different parts of the situation, and somebody who's following a virtue ethics moral theory may not decide something the same way that somebody who's a pure egoist would do, right? Um, now, moral theories not only have to be able to tell us what to do, they also have to be able to account for why people do the things they do, how they develop towards the good, um, how they want to arrange their lives, what they want to be valuing, what they want uh, to, be, to be sacrificing, and um, one of the things they have to be able to do in order to carry that out is to address other moral theories and to address the criticisms that people make of them. <clears throat> so I have an analogy here for you. Think of, in, in every one of your majors uh, that you're studying, you are learning a craft, you're learning a discipline, and sooner or later, you're actually going to have to exercise some sort of leadership in that discipline. 
Right now you're in the learning process, right? So this is actually, I know you don't realize this at the time, but this is actually the fun part. Um, once you get done and you're actually out there practicing your craft, you have to make the case for what it is that you propose. So if you're in business, <coughs> you're going to be in meetings where the boss has called you in and wants to know three or four different ways of looking at the situation and what ought to be done in order to market this product or should this company be bought or you know, how should the decisions be made. And you're going to have to write a report and you're going to have to come up with that. If you're a historian, you're going to have to propose a history of something, a narrative, and there's going to be other people out there who are writing on the same thing and not coming to the same conclusions as you are. If you're, um, you know, in uh, the arts, you're going to have to struggle against other artists. <laughs> and you're going to have to make a case for why you should get grant money <clears throat> or why somebody should buy your stuff instead of somebody else's. Um, you, you can just go on and on and on and on. Um, this, is, this is a common experience that you're going to have. Now, if you're going to say that your proposal is the best one, there's a couple ways to do that, right? So imagine a, a playing field now. You've got, say, five competitors, and you're one of them. And you all want the same thing. You all want <coughs> to get the, the seal of approval. Um, how do you make your case? Or think about another example. Going into a job interview, you're one of the last five people. You sent in your Vita or your resume. There were 300 applicants. 200 of them got thrown out right away. Uh, you made it to the, the, to the larger pool. And then that got boiled down to an even smaller pool of maybe 20 applicants. And they did initial interviews by Skype or maybe you went to a job fair or something like that and they weeded out all the people, and now it's you and five other people, and, or you and four other people. <clears throat> and you know those other people. You're actually competing in the same field. You've interacted with them before. You know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. You know what they're likely to say in the, the interview. How do, you, how do you ensure that you're going to get the job? What do you have to do? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, whatever the strengths are, you want to make sure that uh, you at least have them or are stronger where they're weaker. Kind yeah. of ideal. So you, you want to hype up where you're basically stronger and maybe potentially downplay their strengths or weaknesses. Not directly in the interview, but highlight more so it, it, your strengths and why they're more important than something else may potentially yeah. be. It depends on the field. I mean, in some cases, it's legitimate to say, you don't want to hire him. I can do this just as good as he can. Right. Uh, some other cases, you have to be more diplomatic, yeah. right? which is what you're talking about. But you're right. You, you have to not only put your own strengths forward. People, you know, when I ask these questions, and I've asked this in other formats, people say, well, you've got to put, you know, you got to highlight your own strengths, your own good qualities. That's good, but they're doing that too. I mean, by the time that you get to the final five, everybody's got some, some talent. Everybody's got something to put on the table. Um, but that's not enough to actually get you where you need to go. You can also just, you know, cut down on them and say, <clears throat> that guy's a drunk. You know, this one has affairs in the office. Um, this one's on Facebook all the time. You know, you, you can do that, but that's probably not going to be very effective. Those sort of ad hominem, they call them, attacks. If you really want to make your case, you have to do exactly uh, what, what you just said. You have to say, well, here's a strength that they have, and, I, and it doesn't look like I have that strength, but I really do. You know, they, on, my, on my resume, um, I know that they have more years of experience in this field, but if you actually look at my resume more carefully, you'll see that I did an internship in that, and my internship was at the top firm in that field, so it probably should count more than theirs. That would be a way to, to ensure that you're actually going to get the job. Um, or when you have to do reports and you're, you have you know, other people to argue against, you're going to say, yeah, I know they made these points, but my theory or my view can actually account for all those points, and I also have this. So that's what John Stuart Mill is doing with utilitarianism. He is, in effect, saying, 
utilitarianism can address any of the things that are right in the other moral theories, um, it can incorporate them, it can show that we've actually got them, and then we've also got more. For an example of a moral theory that doesn't do this very well, think about the might makes right philosophy. Um, or think about emotivism. One reason why emotivism isn't a very good moral theory, because at bottom, if you're an emotivist, everything boils down to, because I said so, or because I feel that way. So if, if you have an emotivist and a virtue ethicist, and the virtue ethicist says, you know, you really ought to be cultivating these, these in traits of character that we call virtues, and it requires uh, sacrifices on your part, the emotivist will say something like, yeah, I mean, if you're into that sort of thing, then uh, that's for you, but um, not everybody's into that, and other things are for them. Is that a very satisfying treatment of this, this concept of virtue? Virtues would just be things that you happen to be into, things that, you, you, you know, this turns you on. The idea of being a just person, you like that, so, yeah, go ahead and be a just person. Is that, is that actually going to make you a just person? Is that an adequate understanding of justice? Or say courage or moderation? Probably not. Or if you have the might makes right philosophy, how, what would they make of, say, temperance? <coughs> well, temperance or moderation, if somebody makes you do it, then that's the right thing to do. If they order you to be temperate, then that's the right thing to do. But um, otherwise, there's really no value to it whatsoever. Does that adequately capture that? This is one of the, the tests for moral theories. That's, that's why utilitarianism is one of the big contenders, because it can actually address the other moral theories. So let's look at these criticisms then. Um, Bentham said his stuff in very emphatic ways. This could lead to misunderstandings at times. Um, one of them doesn't really have anything to do with Bentham. And he starts off with this. And this is an interesting one to think about, especially for our culture. There's actually a line of, of clothing out there called uh, utilitarian clothing that I came across when I was doing a little web search. Um, and they, they do have stuff that is fairly utilitarian, at least in one sense. When you use the word utilitarian, and you're not talking about moral theory, you're just using it as an adjective, very often it has the connotation of being stuff that's just usable and doesn't really have any attractiveness to it or any enjoyment to it or, or pleasantness to it. And I've got a great example right here. I've got a prop. This is the reason why the door is closed is because I took the door stop. Um, and this door stop is not particularly um, attractive, is it? This is a purely utilitarian thing in that sense of the term. I mean, look at it, you know, the wood is pitted. Uh, it was made out of cheap, um, cheap lumber to begin with. When the person cut it, they didn't do a very um, good job of not scoring it. It's got chips out of it. There's like a little bit of paint here and there. Um, is this something that if you had a nice, you know, attractive home, you would want sitting around unless you're being kind of ironic or hipster or something like that? Um, probably not, right? Um, are there ways this could be improved to make it more attractive? Maybe you paint it all one color, you know, or sand it and then varnish it nicely. And, and now we, but does it do the same job? This works pretty good, doesn't it? This works just as good as if it was painted whatever your favorite color is with your very high grade of paint. Um, or you know, somebody carved maybe a, a pastoral scene on the side, you know, it would still hold the door, wouldn't it? It has a, a purpose, and it serves the purpose just fine. Utilitarian clothing or utilitarian architecture or stuff like that would mean architecture that it works, but it's not particularly pleasing to the eye or to the other senses. Um, is that what utilitarianism, as a moral theory from what you know, is that what it's putting forth as an ideal? What do you think? Yeah. No. Why not? It, um, at least what I got from Bentham is that it's to create the most pleasure. Use looking for things 
for what they their use is, mm -hmm. but their use in terms of how much pleasure it will bring, not exactly. what it does. Yeah, that, that's very good. Um, now, if it was down to something like, you know, we can feed 100 people um, really boring food, or we can only feed one person really, really great food, um, Bentham would say, well, you know, the, the pain that you're preventing by feeding them the, the boring food is outweighing the pleasure of the, that one person. But if you can feed 100 people and not feed them boring food, that's better than feeding them boring food. There's, no, there's nothing good about boring food. There's nothing good about gray buildings. There's nothing good intrinsically about simple doorstops. If you can make things better, more likely to produce pleasure, it's a better thing to do. Somebody had their hand up. Uh, I did, but you, you targeted it. OK. Yeah. So this is not really a, a valid objection. And then you notice Mill goes up over to the other extreme now. So if we know that it actually is about pain and pleasure, some people say, well, that's a bad point about utilitarianism and any kind of hedonism. Um, and think about, you know, when we use the word hedonism, we don't usually use it as a <coughs> word of praise in our society, do we? We talk about somebody being hedonistic. We mean that as a criticism. We mean that all they care about is pleasure, and generally we mean all they care about is um, immediate sensual pleasure. You know, that's all they, they focus on. So they'll do anything to get their, their fix. Um, one way to express this is to say that utilitarianism, like other forms of hedonism, is a philosophy fit for pigs. I mean, pigs have a lot of pleasure, don't they? They'll eat just about anything you can put in front of them. Um, some gruesome things I won't tell you about. Right? <laughs> some stories about pig farmers that, uh, and some of the things pigs have eaten. Um, and they seem to like it. And pigs, um, they like to lay in the mud and roll around. And you know we know that's because they don't sweat and they need it to, to keep cool, but that makes them feel better, right? And they like physical activity, running around, bumping into each other. They're actually out in the wild, pretty mean and aggressive. Uh, and why are they that way? Because they like it. They enjoy that. Um, they like all the, the, the things that other animals like. And, and we like those things too, don't we? I mean, if you were a hedonist like Aristippus, then what would you pursue? Get in as much you know, pleasures of taste and scent and wearing clothes that feel good to you or look good to you and going to the shows or the movies or whatever as much as you can get in as much sex as you possibly can uh, hopefully without any you know commitments that might produce any sort of problems for you um, sleep in whenever you want to um, don't commit yourself to any big projects that are going to take away from your pleasures because you know this is the good life that I guess would fit into that but did, did Epicurus fit that bill? Didn't he distinguish between higher and uh, lower pleasures? Mental pleasures and physical pleasures? If you can make that distinction, and that's what we're going to focus on a little bit later, that addresses that problem. You can say, yeah, I mean, we don't roll around in the mud. There's probably some people who enjoy that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, right? Because anything you pick, there's probably somebody who enjoys it. We have other things that are sort of like that. Um, what do we roll around in? Um, on massage tables, on tanning beds. Um, we like to sleep in, you know, get under the, the warm blankets, that sort of thing. We like to bask in the sun. Um, those are all physical pleasures, right? And utilitarianism can recognize that those are good, but it doesn't just stay with those, does it? There's other kinds of pleasures. Um, let's go on to the next one. Now, this is a different kind of objection. There are other moral theories out there, and we're going to look at one, Immanuel Kant, starting next week, that say that happiness really shouldn't be the goal. If you want to talk about right and wrong, morally good and bad, then you don't focus on pleasure and happiness. You focus on some other things, like, say, duty or virtue. And, you know, the things that oftentimes in real life require us to sacrifice our little share of happiness or, or pleasure. You know, if you think about this, if you um, get married, 
as I think many of you plan to eventually. Um, you live, you know, 10 years with your spouse, and you're having a great time, and suddenly they come down with some sort of not only terminal but debilitating disease. Are you going to stay with them? Knowing that who they are and the pleasures that you're having with them are now going to slowly disappear. Maybe they've got early onset Alzheimer's or they've got MS or um, they're in a terrible car accident and then you know, they lose, they become paraplegic. Um, you're going to lose out on a lot of pleasures. Are you going to stick with them uh, and say, I made a commitment even though I'm not having as much fun um, I'm going to honor that commitment. I'm going to sacrifice my own happiness to fulfill my duty. Or are you going to, as a lot of people do, bail and say, you know, the good times are over. See you later. Good luck. People do that, don't they? Some people do. Um, well, Mill would say, why does the person prefer duty or say virtue, right? If you want to be virtuous, um, you want to be courageous, what do you have to do? You have to stand up to fears. Is that fun? Probably not. That's why you're afraid of the stuff, right? That's why you haven't done it up to this point. Um, if you're choosing to do that, what's motivating you? Kant would say the, the, the pure idea of duty. Um, <coughs> But isn't there a kind of higher pleasure or happiness or satisfaction that comes with doing the right thing? If that really motivates, if you're willing to sacrifice your happiness in one respect for doing the right thing, maybe you're motivated by the pleasure of being able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I did the right thing, or being motivated by not wanting to have the pain of looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, you're a bad person to yourself. Um, well, then utilitarianism could take, a, could take account of that, couldn't it? Because that would still be pleasures and pains, yeah. I was going to say that, like the, the mental, if you're somebody that wants mental pleasure or the physical pleasure, then you would be rewarded by the mental pleasure of... You're right. And it might be more of a, that's creating more pleasure than that. Even like during that, those five seconds where you're standing up to your fear, yeah. it creates a lifetime long pleasure of remembering when I stood up to that bully or something. Yeah, and it may also end up being the condition for good consequences later. Yeah. It's easier to stand up to the bully the, the next time. But you, you guys have all probably experienced this in public speaking. I think I've used this as an example before, right? When I first started teaching, I was really nervous every time before I have to give a, a lecture. I went on for about a year. Um, now, you know, if somebody wants me to give a lecture, I don't have any fear about that anymore because I know what to expect. But I did at one time. And not having that fear is a good consequence for me. It allows me to, to um, actually enjoy getting up here and talking, which is kind of good because I have to do this for a living, right? So any of you that are going to have to do this sort of thing for a living, you might want to kind of get here too. Um, let's look at the next one. Utilitarianism could make us cold and unsympathizing or uncaring about other people individually. So maybe the utilitarian, because they look at uh, society or the community as a whole, um, they, they look at what's good for everyone, but they're not really that interested in what is good for her, or what's good for her, or what's good for, for him. And maybe things like personal relationships don't matter that much to a utilitarian. And wouldn't that end up maybe, here's an example. There are some professors who say things like, I teach to my class as a whole. I don't actually want to get to know the students because then, you know, there might be favoritism or, you know, uh, I'm just going to, you know, they're going to be the next class around. I don't want to get too attached to them myself. Um, and besides, I've got too many damn students anyway to, to keep their names straight or, or things like that. Professors say things like that. I'm just going to teach to the class as a whole, and if you know they get something out of it, that's great. But you know, as individuals, they don't really matter. Now, if I act like that, if say you come to my office hours and you sit down and you start talking with me and you say something, as a student, I have students 
all the time, every semester, who come in and say, I'm really struggling with the material. I don't really, this isn't really my cup of tea. I'm not really that into this sort of stuff. Uh, and they're making, you know, sort of an honest confession. They're showing me who they are. Just take some guts, right? Um, what if I respond to them and I say, it would be in your best interest to blah, 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 as a student. And I don't meet them as a person. How would that make them feel? Let's say you come in, 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 in my office hours like that. And I say something like, well, you got to just get with the program. I teach the class as a whole. <laughs> How would you feel? Worse. Yeah. Worse, yeah. Go ahead. It was just me like away from the class because like, I know I can't go to the teacher for help. And like, I'm very like, discouraged. Yeah, it, it, it's discouraging. Um, it's painful in a way. It might, <coughs> might, might feel kind of um, embarrassed or humiliated, uh, that sort of thing. Mill says personal relationships are important. You know, the, the society as a whole is important, but why? Because the society is composed of this person, this person, this person, this person. It's not as if there's anything like society or the community out there all by itself. It's an aggregate of people. So loving your family and behaving in a loving way within your family would be a good thing for utilitarian. Um, Having friendship relations, you know, that, that develop over time, that would be a good thing for them. That would bring about pleasure. Would... Yeah, I don't think, I think when, like, if a student were to go to a teacher, they're not looking for special treatment or even, like, favoritism. They're just looking to be treated as an individual. It's yeah. not, like, a number. And, um, like, when you're treated as a number in a class of 30 people, then it's a lot less personal. Yeah, you're right. One thing I was going to point out about utilitarianism, it kind of goes against basic human instinct, which is individual survival, if it comes down to it. Or, and, or my group. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, pretty much. Like, if it comes down to it, let's say you're on train tracks with, with another person, that you're both tied down, you pull a lever, it's going to kill the other person, or it's going to kill you or five other people. You're most likely at that moment, if you only have like two seconds to think about it, you're pulling that leaf. And it's that's what I think. It's a lot of conditioning. I think. Right. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's just that instinct that like, I want to survive. Like, yeah. you know. And, and Mill, Mill actually, um, and Bentham does talk about this a little bit, Mill does more. It says that until um, utilitar utilitarianism, is, utilitarianism is sort of reworked the way in which we think about things through moral education and, and conditioning, we're not going to be the kind of people that will typically favor the interests of the community over, over our own or you know, those who are close to us. That one actually reminds me of the old joke. I think you guys have heard this. There's two guys. They're out camping. And um, the bear comes charging them. And the first guy starts putting on running shoes. And the second guy goes, what the hell are you doing? You know, the bear can outrun us. It doesn't matter if you put on running shoes or not. It's still going to eat us. And he says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> so he's sacrificing the other guy, you know, for, for his own selfish interests. That's sort of like the train track. Right. Um, I, I think you're right. Um, but, but Mill and, and Bentham would see that as um, just a sign of how we need to sort of change the way in which we, we educate people. Right, but the question does become then, can you ever really get rid of that though? Yeah, that's probably a bigger question than, than we, can, we can go into here. Right. Um, novelists have tried to deal with that. If any of you have ever read um, Brave New World by Huxley or um, is Walden Two would be along those sort of lines. There's other examples of this where somebody, I think, uh, tries to see what utilitarianism might look like if it was put into the whole of society. Uh, if we thought of everything in terms of pains and pleasures. Um, let's go on with the, the other one though. This is going to be an important one, not this class session, but next class session. When we look at justice and rights and stuff like that. Remember the example that I brought up before, if we could pick on one person in class, produce a lot of displeasure for them, but it produced a lot of pleasure for us, like the Japanese game show example. Um, that would be okay from a utilitarian perspective, even if we did terrible, degrading, humiliating things to that person that 
violated them as a person, violated their human dignity. Um, well, Mill says it's not quite so simple. Because if you were going to do that thing, yeah, in the immediate situation, that could produce more pleasure than pain. But if you did that and you made a practice of that, how would that affect society overall? Wouldn't that lead to more pain overall than pleasure, knowing that we're the kind of people who indulge in that sort of thing? Wouldn't that affect us? Wouldn't the fact that maybe somebody else would do that to you or to those that you care about produce some at least worry or anxiety in your mind that might in, you know, uh, taint the pleasure that you're feeling in watching the other person be humiliated or bullied or things like that? But we're going to put that one off. Because um, now I want to come back to this, this, this uh, issue of qualitative pleasures and pains. Um, what determines whether um, a pain or a pleasure is of higher quality, not just quantity, but the quality? Um, you know, Bentham put everything on the same level. He thought you could calculate everything against everything else. So th this works for some things, like candy bars. Um, two, candy, two candy bars, because they're the same kind of candy bar, it's pretty much twice as good as one candy bar, right? Or think about money. If you, if you give me a 20 and you say, hey, I need change for a 20, and I say, I'll give you two fives, is that going to work? You'd be a sucker to take that, wouldn't you? And if I were to say, um, I'll give you a 20 for, for two fives, you would take that deal and you say, that guy's a sucker. Because I'm not realizing that those are measurable against each other, aren't they? <coughs> and could you trade off different kinds of deals against each other? Like, um, it happens all the time when you're young. Oh, when you swap things with yeah. each other? Yeah, you're right. That's a good example. I hadn't thought of that. Um, like the pudding for like graham crackers or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> With us, it was the action figures, you know, and we'd swap them back and forth every so often. Um, and marbles, too. We actually still played with marbles back then. Uh, and trading cards. Trading cards, right? Um, I don't know if people still do that as kids, but we had, like, baseball cards and hockey cards, and then there were Star Wars cards and a couple other things. So would, I'll give you one of these if you give me these, these five. Why do you do that? Because you're going to get a, the same amount of pleasure, roughly. Utilitarian perspective. Um, are there qualitative differences? Are there are there cases where one pleasure is a higher pleasure and one's a lower, and no amount of the lower pleasure would be enough to make up for that higher pleasure? Um, Mill thinks there are. So you know, think about candy bars. Now, you all like candy bars, right? Anybody ever doesn't like a candy bar? Probably like different candy bars, but let's say we could get get an assortment. Right? Um, there was a comedian, and you know, it was a comedy skit, I think, on Mad TV a long time ago. You, remember, you know those Klondike bars? What would you do for a Klondike bar? Well, what would you do for a Klondike bar? Um, there's some things that are you know, fairly simple, like I'd go up to a complete stranger and say, I love Klondike. Okay, so I would, that would be a little embarrassing for me, but I would trade off that, that, that pain for the pleasure of the Klondike bar, right? Now, this, this, this comedy skit was, you know, would you kill a man for a Klondike bar? And, you know, you got to go along with the premise a little bit. This person really, really likes Klondike bars. And they say, I don't know. I think I would. And then they, they actually go and they, they, they kill somebody in the skit for the Klondike bar. And, you know, they're kind of, they, they, they have, like, their hands are all bloody and all that. And they're eating the Klondike bar and they look sort of... Uh, as if they're undergoing this ecstatic experience. Well, you know, that's, that's a comedy skit, and we laugh at it because it's so far-fetched, because even a whole case of Klondike bars isn't going to, um, for a utilitarian, justify killing somebody. You know? Or think about certain degrading things. Would you, um, what are things we find humiliating? Would you allow somebody to go through, this is assuming that you've actually got something to hide, which might not be the case for you. Would you allow somebody to go through every document <coughs> out there about you that exists um, for a lifetime supply of Klondike bars? 
or whatever it is that we have to buy. I'm not that big on them. I, you know, maybe a bunch of McCollins. Would you go? For, would you go for that? I mean, if you don't have anything to hide, it's a great thing. You just got yourself a lifetime supply. If you have to think about it, here's what you're thinking about. I don't know. That that is a qualitatively different kind of pain. No amount of this is actually going to make up for this. Um, or let's say we, you know, we say something like this. You're going to go to a desert island. All of you like hot chocolate, right? Do you? Is there anybody who doesn't like hot chocolate? I was going to use beer as an example before, but not everybody likes beer. Um, so hot chocolate. Um, how many of you really like hot chocolate? Is there anything else we could pick that might might have a greater appeal? Something. Oh, do you like? Do you guys all like coffee drinks? Like you go to Starbucks. Okay. So you're going to go to a desert island, and it's sort of like you know a reality TV show. So there's there's some things you're, you don't actually have to worry about food or animals attacking you or getting dysentery or malaria or any of these or shark attacks or any of those sort of things. But you're going to be there for five years. Now you have a choice to make. Here's, here's what they, they put in front of you. Would you like to have an unlimited supply of all the Starbucks drinks, the whole thing, even, even the holiday drinks, uh, whenever you want, um, at any time that you want? Uh, and they're all made, you know, well, all the time. Or would you, be, would you rather be allowed to bring a library? Probably library. <clears throat> How many of you would take the library? Is there anybody who would take the Starbucks drinks? You would? Really? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I like Starbucks a lot myself. Um, why would you take the library? Those of you who would take the library instead of the Starbucks drinks, why would you take the local library? Yes. I mean, you can only drink coffee so many times like before like you start building at least a high tolerance or it starts getting boring to you. If you got a whole library you can read like different stories. You can kind of like escape in your reading from the place where you're at. I mean think about it, you're in a desert, there's not a whole lot to see. So reading yeah. kind of gets the imagination going too. Yeah. So it's more of a mental pleasure I would say rather than a, a physical one. There's a wider range like you pointed out. Um, there's only so much you can do with a coffee drink. I, I worked as a barista, actually, for a while before it was even called barista uh, in, in a cafe. And I experimented with just about anything you could, you could do. Some of them were awful uh, things to do. Some syrups you shouldn't mix together. Um, but after a while, you're right. You, get, you get, get kind of bored with it. There's only so much you can do. And that's not to say that if you can have Starbucks unlimited for the rest of your life, that that wouldn't be a good thing. From a utilitarian perspective, go for it. What are you going to say? Well, this would be like an outdoor kiosk or something like that. I mean, you, you assume you've got a little hut, and you can read in the hut, or you can take your coffee in the hut. What's that? Well, it's a desert island. You're, you're doing the desert island thing, whether you like it or not. It's a, it's a question of whether you go for the Starbucks or for the, the library. Um, which do you, and, and notice, this is a forced choice. You have to choose one or one or the other. Um, why would you choose the Starbucks? Because you love Starbucks so much that you get, get so much pleasure out of it. Okay. Um, now, another thing that, that you said is really important. Books appeal to our imagination. They engage our higher faculties. <clears throat> I'm willing to actually say, too, that to a certain extent, Mill might be a little bit too crude in this, and that Starbucks drinks and certain kinds of foods could actually appeal to our higher faculties as well in certain ways. But not to the degree that books do. Yeah. I mean, I love iced tea, but I think I would just... Like if, say, we changed it up and it was iced tea instead of Starbucks. Okay. I think I'd still choose a library because I would just get so bored. Just because I just be even if you added like mango to it and peach and yeah, green tea versus white tea versus. I mean, yeah, it would taste great, but it's just either way, I would get so bored with that without having anything. Well, that's there's something to that, and you can you can say the same thing about any of the basic physical pleasures that we tend to share with the animals. There's only so much you can do with them. Um, food, there's a, a, probably a wider range because you can add so many things, but even that, there's only so many ways to make a hamburger. You can put mushrooms on it, you can put blue cheese on it, 
but eventually you, you run out of things that you can do with it. Um, with books, maybe you can run out of things, but nobody's actually found that that point yet. Uh, somebody had their hand up over, over here. Um, did you have your hand up? Did you have your hand up? Well, so you get the basic idea. There are, there are higher pleasures, and what Mill calls an ideal judge is somebody who knows inside and out both pleasures. So you would have to have somebody who actually really does like Starbucks. If you don't like Starbucks, then it's, there's no useful question there. Um, that's part of why I didn't use beer, because some people don't like beer. You know, I happen to like it. I used to actually brew beer myself, because I, I liked it so much. Um, but if it, if it doesn't appeal to you, you, you can't be a good judge for that. Also, if you don't fully appreciate you know, reading books, you wouldn't be a good judge of the pleasure of reading books. Um, or let's say the pleasure was watching football on television. If you don't get into football on television because that just never appealed to you, you're not really a good judge of where that fits in in the hierarchy of pleasures. You have to be somebody who's actually experienced these pleasures. And Mill says that a person who has actually experienced both of these pleasures, you know, reasonably well, will, will invariably choose the higher pleasure over the lower pleasure. Why? Because the higher pleasure actually is a better pleasure. It offers us more pleasure on a different level than the lower pleasure does. Um, and it, it, uh, it appeals to what's distinctively human about us. So let's think about some of our, our different pleasures that we, we experience. Um, this would be a good place actually to, to ask you this, this question. What are, what are some of the experiences that you've had, could be recently, could be in the past, or some of the things that you, you know of, practices, things like that, that give you a lot of pleasure, that are, that are very enjoyable to you. Um, yeah. World's in Georgia. Okay. Going to the gym. Um, what else? What are other things you find? Um, things on the go. Okay. Said something like candy or you know um, French, fries. French fries. Yeah, maybe uh, McDonald's French fries are a lot better when they're actually cooked in beef grease. You know, we used to go, go and get them after the movies. Going to the movies, going to the to the amusement park, not just the roller coaster, but the whole amusement park. Um, kids like watching cartoons um, or Disney shows or Nickelodeon or what have you. Um, Okay, so we have all these, these sorts of things. Um, what makes them pleasurable? What are, what are we actually, what are the components of these? Why is going to the gym pleasure? Six pack. To get a six pack? <laughs> or do you mean other people's six packs? Not, um, I don't look at well, I mean, you could, I mean, you, <laughs> you could go to the gym because you like looking at other people's bodies. Um, that's one reason people do. <laughs> I'll tell you, when I, when I was younger, um, even younger than you guys are now, I used to, I was an endurance lifter, so I would do 
medium weight, uh, high reps, high amounts of sets. I had these, these workouts that I would do like three hours a day every day with weights. Huh. And, I, and I would go to the Y to do it because the Y was the serious place to lift weights in, in the town that I was living. And it was really interesting because a lot of the guys that were there that I was learning a bit from, they, they were really built, right? And they would do their serious workout at the Y. And there was only there was only one woman who also did the weight training in that room. And she was a female bodybuilder. And she was, you know, she wasn't like the, the super, you know, gigantic ones. She was like really trim but really strong. Uh, she was actually one of the trainers. Now what was interesting is a lot of these guys, after they would do their real workout, then they'd go to Vic, uh, was it Vic Tandy? Used to be called. Um, anyway, just think of these gyms where now it's, it's uh, very nice in the gym and mirrors all around, and people go there and kind of socialize. Mm -hmm. And why would they go there, do you think? Show off. Show off, pick up girls. They, they wouldn't actually do a real workout there. They just like, you know, get on a machine next to somebody and start chatting and, and all that. <laughs> and, and they wouldn't have gotten that way by doing that sort of practice. They got that way by actually exercising, and they were doing it as a means to an end to try to uh, pick up dates. Um, so they, I mean, they were going there because they liked looking at people, and back then it was like uh, leotards and things like that. Um, and, some, and some of the women who went there, they would go and they'd, they'd like put on makeup before they well, work out. Say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is back in the this is back in the late eighties. Yeah. Uh, there is like in this area, there's a specific gym exactly like what, what you're that? saying. So it's so funny because I'm a Which local. One? At Gold's Gym, uh, like I'll go I there go sometimes, there. <laughs> and, and like okay. I, I'm going there to work out, and like you see all these girls are like dressed up, their hair is all done. I'm like, that, I'm like, it's gonna get ruined in like 15 minutes, but no, it's still the same. By the time they get out, they literally like go there to get picked up. I feel like that. What? Really stress? Yeah. Really stress? Okay. Stressing sometimes it, it feels good to do some physical activity. You know, like some people like to lift weights, other people like to hit the, hit the bag, um, other people like to run because it, it helps them uh, deal with the stresses of their day. That would be less maybe a direct pleasure and more getting rid of pain. You know, for utilitarians, getting rid of pain is, is pleasurable. I'm not sure if this comes under physical exercise, but like just working out releases endorphins, which just makes you happy. Yeah, um, they're actually they're actually starting to think that if you are mild to moderately depressed, maybe antidepressants aren't the way to go, and exercise is the way to go. Although the verdict's still kind of out on that, the research is, is uh, uh, not not extensive enough at this point to decide. Um, but you're right. Yeah, physically there are certain things. You know, there's a lot of things that that tap into the pleasure centers of our Brains. That's why drugs are so pleasurable for people because they go right there. Um, tanning actually can become addictive because tanning also, you know, hits those pleasure centers. Some people get hooked on it because it feels so good to do. Yeah. Uh, ever since my back tell surgery, I'm not one of them. No. Ever since my back surgery uh, over winter break, so I haven't like done any exercise since since winter break, and yeah. I just. I can remember from when I used to exercise how I'm like so much more cranky now and like on edge because it just makes you so less stressed when you. You're, you're right. Yeah. Um, so there there are a lot of different good good things about it, going to the gym and exercising. Maybe also socializing. Right? Yeah. Uh, you get to know some of the people, or you, you go work out with somebody. Is that part of it? Also, maybe like improve self-esteem. Okay. Um, let's put that over here with the getting yeah. fit part. Um, now, there's some painful things. I mean, if you're lifting weights, you're actually hurting yourself, right? If, 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 if it doesn't hurt, you're not going to get an awful lot out of it, is what they say. Um, no pain, no gain. Uh, but you're training that off for all these 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 good things. And now notice. Um, do you see a lot of animals going to the gym? 
That's a distinctively human thing. Animals do exercise, and they do actually take enjoyment in physical activity. You know, I let, I've got two dogs, and they, they're in the apartment some of the time, and sometimes they're out in the yard, and you let them out, and they run around and jump on each other and bite each other, and then go bark over here, and if I throw a stick, they, they, they go chase the stick, and then taunt me with it, you know, because they want me to chase them around. Um, they like that. We enjoy physical exercise. Um, do dogs worry about whether they're fit? Do pigs worry about whether they're fit? Do they have self-esteem issues? <laughs> no, we do. I mean, uh, humans, uh, like, we never actually, like, needed to exercise per se, like, have a specific set place to go until we pretty much got desk Sedentary. jobs. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's sure. what it is. I realized that, like, I used to work on campus and, like, fixing computers. And I have to carry computers around campus yeah. and so forth. And then I got a desk job, and, like, immediately I gained, like, 20 pounds, like, right away. Sure. Like, it's, like, the worst thing ever. Like, I, you know, I didn't have to exercise or eat anything I wanted. Except yeah. I kept eating everything I wanted, and that's what happened no to me too. Afterwards, yeah. yeah. I went from I went from uh, biking everywhere to having a car, and um, began teaching and s spending a lot of time sitting. Right. And that's all I got, you know. So I put the weight on. Um, then I didn't have enough time to exercise too. But you know, we we did human beings did also realize that if we want to do certain things, it, it helps to do certain kinds of exercise. Like if you want to go, you know, fight the, the animals, you should probably bulk up. Um, so we, we do that. Other animals don't do that. They certainly don't tie in their self-image with it. I mean, they may have, you know, they, they get upset because the other dog beat them in a, in a dominance contest or something like that. But then they accept it. Um, there might be something to the de-stressing thing for animals. If they don't get enough exercise, they, they get stressed. Socializing. Um, I mean, it's, it really depends on how we're socializing. There are, there are sort of animal ways of socializing. It's nice just to be next to other people. Dogs do that too, though. Cats do that even. Um, but we talk with each other. And we talk with each other about topics. And we get to know each other. I'm not sure that you can say the same thing about, about the animals that don't communicate the way we do. No. OK. Um, let's think about the roller coaster one. Very you know, innocent pleasure. Um, what do you like about it? Adrenaline. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Uh, how do you spell? Adrenaline. A D R E N. A L I N E. Nice. No, I wouldn't be able to spell that one, right? Um, so there's an adrenaline adrenaline rush that comes with it. Um, we're all probably familiar with that. Uh, we like doing things that we feel are kind of scary, but not truly scary. If the roller coaster we suddenly think that it's, it actually is in reality unsafe. Now it's a whole different ride and we're no longer experiencing pleasure, right? Now we're experiencing anxiety and, and pain. Um, I don't think I've ever had an adrenaline rush like the roller coaster. Really? I don't, roller coaster. Yeah. I don't think, I've played like big football games and stuff like that, but I don't think anything comes close to an adrenaline rush. Like roller coaster. No, roller coaster is the biggest adrenaline rush I've ever had. Pretty, yeah. 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 That could be. That's going to vary from person to person, I think, depending on uh, what, what um, evokes our sense of fear or challenge or, or things along those lines. What about like, watching a really scary movie? Um, that's, that's kind of along the same kind of that's lines. Different. That's different. Yeah. That just freaks me out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's the whole idea, because like, I'm really into roller coasters. It's the whole idea of you're like literally risking your life, but you're making it. Yeah. And that's what makes it so much better. Like I used to write like sports bikes and I, you know do like tricks that I'm never going to do again because my arm went like this after a while yeah like landed on my arm but it's that whole idea of you're doing something that's risky that could cause you to lose your life but you're making it through and that's why that adrenaline rush is so big and people enjoy it yeah and that's why the kiddie roller coaster doesn't quite cut it you can't yeah. take I used to go to this place, Marriott's Great America, which is now Six Flags Great America. And they had one roller coaster called the Wizard. It was sort of like the beginning roller coaster. And, you know, it had some, some turns and, and, you know, spirals and stuff like that. But you didn't go upside down. Because when I was a kid, that was the big thing. They, I guess they were having trouble making roller coasters where it was you could safely go upside down and, you know, they could predict that you were going to come out of it. <laughs> and then they came out with 
uh, some roller coasters where you did go upside down. And the first one was, of course, just a big loop. And my dad would take me on, on, on roller coasters back then. And so we went on that. And then Great America came out with the Demon. That's one, actually, that later on people did get stuck on. <laughs> um, and that one had uh, not just loops, but actually like corkscrews, right? You could tell how much, if you're going to try to do this in a utilitarian way, how long would a person be willing to stand in line? Because you could go on the wizard like five times for the amount of time that it would take you to wait in line to go on the demon. But people would, the, the wizard was always empty because most people wanted to go on, on the demon. And then they came out with the American Eagles, all wood roller coasters, still the largest wooden roller coaster in the world. And the line for that was like two hours long. Um, but we waited in it because we wanted to have that experience. And we felt that there was something better about that than just going on the wizard. Um, and if you actually, now here's another thing where it gets more interesting. If you know something about roller coasters, if you like research, if you compare them across each other, that's again a more distinctively human activity. That's involving your intellect. And that can make your pleasure great. If you know something about the thing you're taking pleasure in, like, you know, if you really like Starbucks, you can research coffee. And, and there's a whole world out there about why this coffee has this taste, why this one has that taste. Culinary is a great place to do that right up the road. That improves your experience, doesn't it? When you actually know something about why this wine that you're tasting tastes the way that it does and where it came from, why this roller coaster was put together this way, and why the bend has to come here instead of over here, that improves your experience. When you watch a football show, if you're into football, and you see the talking heads or talking suits, you know, deconstructing what went, what went right in the game and what went wrong in the game, if you don't just turn them off and say, shut up, you guys, but you actually watch them, and then you watch the highlights, and that improves your experience, it's because that appeals to your intellect. That appeals to something distinctively human about you. Spending time with your family. What is it you like about, who had that one? Um, what, do, what do you like about spending time with your family? I don't know, I went on this weekend. It was like really relaxing. I got to hang out with my parents, so. Okay. Um, familiar places, being in a sort of routine with them again. Mm -hmm. You wake up, you know, like you, yeah. Sunday morning, maybe dad makes breakfast or something. Um, familiar routine. There's something comforting about that. Animals have that too. Um, is there a distinctively human thing about that? I don't know. Your family probably has some distinctive things that you do that are not just purely animal pleasures. Um, getting to know other people. Again, I, I, I think dogs get to know each other on some level, and cats do as well, but I think that we human beings get to know each other on much deeper levels. Um, winning or succeeding in a, in a project. It's fun to win, to begin with, right? I, I, I mentioned this before, I, I like to pass people when I'm driving. Uh, it makes it a more enjoyable experience to me. Um, which is stupid, but you know you can relate to it. Um, but that's a pretty low level kind of thing. It's just like I, I got you know past you, I won, you lost. Uh, and when you graduate, how's that going to feel when you graduate? I mean, there's the relief. Oh, I don't have to do this crap anymore. But that's going to go away really quickly. Um, what else? There's a sense of accomplishment, right? I hope for all of you. That's going to come with that. And. Is it possible for a pig, a dog, a, a llama, uh, a mouse to feel that sort of sense of accomplishment or even to wrap its head around that? I don't think so. Go ahead. When my dog catches uh, the tennis ball, she seems pretty happy that she succeeded in getting it. Yeah. But is that on the level of like having a long-term project that she's taken the initiative in and developed? Or I don't think dogs do that. Well. They don't do as much as we do. I don't know. I feel like compared to what they actually do and what we actually do, it's kind of on the same level. Like they they worked a long way from what they think to 
do that. Right. But so, they don't do as much as we do in the first place. So, That's right. just what I So they have a different frame of reference. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I think it's different. I don't think a doll is going to be like, yo, remember that time I caught that ball? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an idiot. Because they can't talk. That's why. That's why. <laughs> well, do they, do, they, do they actually, I mean, we do evaluate ourselves over time. Yeah. Go ahead. I think with dogs, it's about media pleasure rather than <clears throat> us working on something to get it. Like, dogs are thinking, I need to get this right away. Oh, great, I got it. Okay, what now? Like, with, with us, they, I don't think... Yeah. They're happy for that moment, but there's no real sense of accomplishment after that. I mean, you, you can think. train dogs to do longer than just immediate projects, like you know, hunting dogs. Um, right. you're, you're out there for the day with them, hunting. But it's still, but, uh, yeah, I don't think a dog would, would, I don't think it's just because they lack speech. They, they don't have, they don't have the other things that go with, with being human. You can, we could go on a hunting trip and then 20 years from now, recall that hunting trip or write a, a story about it to feel the stream or something like that. A dog is, isn't going to do that. It might have, you know, memories that come back to it years and years later, usually when they're sleeping. I think they have those doggy dreams. You know, they're going, oh, oh, you know, stuff like that, right? <laughs> what are you going to say? What about a dog that, um, like that, uh, the seeing eye that I was talking about, that trains for years to be able to, to, to help a blind person through their life? Maybe. That, that's one we're, we're thinking or a, about. Or a, uh, a police dog that yeah, works that's, for that's many it. years to help a, a cop, and then it finally actually does graduate. Oh, and it's done, and it retires. When, when we, uh, you're right that those involve complex tasks, and they, they have to take place over time. Dog trainers, when they want to get dogs, and this works for like horse trainers and all that, if you want to be really successful with them, you get them to do things that they enjoy doing anyway. Same thing with dolphin trainers. Uh, and you um, encourage them in doing that, and then you make it a little bit more complex. Um, so you, you realize the potential of the animal um, as much as it can be. But it only goes so far. Mill, Mill's point is we humans are much less restricted in that, and the things that engage our higher pleasures, our, ultimate, our higher um, faculties, are ultimately much more satisfying. What's something that you find very enjoyable? Yeah. Um, yoga. yoga. Okay. Um, what else? We need to say maybe four or five examples. Yeah. Like uh, sports. Okay. What about sports? Doing them, watching them. <coughs> I like both. I like watching sports, doing sports. Okay. Uh, why don't we put those as two different things? <coughs> Watching sports and um, playing sports. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get two more. Other kinds of things, yeah. Now we need something that's kind of a, a lower kind of pleasure. Anything you like, yeah. Okay. Sleeping. Um, so now with each one of these, think about what you would be willing to trade off against it. What, if you had to choose between them, what you would rank higher than it, what you would rank lower than it. Um, so let's let's use yoga. So, um, what's involved? Let's think about that first of all, because yoga can be just you know watching a video and then doing some of the postures. It can mean going to the class. It can mean actually studying the philosophy behind it. You know, Patanjali's sutras. Um, there's a lot of different possibilities. It can mean just showing up and saying Namaste to people and walking out, right? Um, have walking around with a yoga mat. People do sometimes um, find yoga pants you know, for fashion accessories. Um, what is it that people are enjoying with with yoga? What makes it pleasure? It's your pleasure, so. 
I just think, I mean, why do I like it? Yeah, we'll start with that and we can add more in. Um, I think it's just, I mean, it's a form of exercise that's kind of more peaceful. Um, so I guess. Okay, so it, it, it's physical exercise. It uh, gives a sense of peace, well-being. Um, what else? Does anybody else have any other things they get out of yoga, that components to it that make it pleasurable? Anybody else do yoga? What do, what do you like? That's interesting. Uh, De-stressing. Um, that's less a, a pleasure itself, although you take pleasure in that, and more the removal of a pain, more the removal of, of something that leads to unhappiness, all that stress. Um, okay, this is, this, is, this is good. We'll leave it at, at that for the, the moment. Drawing. Um, you, you had drawing, right? Uh, what is it that you like about drawing? Okay. Coming up with ideas. That, that's interesting right there. Um, what else do you like about it? Do you draw well? I don't like drawing so much because my drawings are awful. You can see how bad my penmanship is. Just imagine how squiggly my, my lines are. Uh, but I used to before my hands started to, to shake. Um, so you you have stiff, I imagine, right? Use of your your, your uh, faculties. Anybody else have anything they, they like about drawing? Yeah. It's a finished product. Okay. Um, something that you can step back and take a look at. Or pass on to somebody else, give them pleasure through that. Yeah. That could also kind of be calming. Calming? Um, yeah, there, there are activities that we get into that um, the, the focusing of attention allows us to. Okay, we'll put that in um, peace of mind as well. Or again, well being. Sometimes it's nice just to have something else to concentrate on besides <clears throat> everything else going around us. That's why people like to doodle. You know, drawing in the big sense is you've actually got you know paper that you picked out for it, or you have some idea. But a lot of us doodle. Um, sleeping. That was, I think that was pretty easy to wrap our heads around. Um, it's a physical pleasure, right? Um, if you don't sleep, you end up feeling pain as a result. Um, how many of you like to hit the snooze button? Not everybody. I'm kind of surprised. Because um, probably, you know why, when, when do you really like to hit the snooze button? There, there's probably two things that go into that. One is when you've actually got enough time that it's not going to cause you anxiety to hit the snooze button. right? The other is when you really need that sleep. When you're really worn out. Either because you stayed up too late or um, you're sick, or because you did a lot of physical exercise, and you like to hit that snooze button and get that extra, what is it, nine minutes in general of, of sleep, and it feels like heaven. Um, watching sports, that's an interesting one. Every human society has some sort of game or sports that they play. Um, we often look down on sports and, and watching sports as a merely, you know, kind of low class, brutish, not, not very important kind of activity. But every civilization develops something, <laughs> develops some sort of activities that they don't just do because they have to, but because they, they, they want to, and then some other people come along and watch it and usually place bets on it. Um, what do you get out of watching sports? Yeah. It's like the, like the pride for like your team, like being 
it's part of like a community almost. Okay, team spirit. Uh, yeah, pride, that sort of thing. Of course, when they lose, you've identified with us. Now you feel bad. Um, so there's some risks with that. What, what do you get out of it? I think it's just fun to watch like the best of the best, like feel the, the best of their sport play, like all their talents. Okay, that's interesting. Watching, I'm going to call this watching excellence. The Greeks were really into games. And they very often held these games in honor of the gods, <coughs> the religious functions. And, you know, they were, there were a lot of people who could run, or a lot of people who could box, or a lot of people who could, um, you know, do horse racing, or all these different kinds of things. But they would pick the best. And why do you pick the best? Because those are actually more fun to watch. We have more enjoyment in watching excellent um, competitors go against each other than just watching, you know, anybody. That's why, you know, um, we've got all these sort of hierarchies, these, these ranking systems. Um, that's why, you know, better teams have higher attendance or a better TV watch. Um, there is a, a pleasure in that, isn't there? Um, anything else that comes with that? You watch sports all by yourself usually? Or you, you, Enjoy watching them with other people. This might apply to the yoga thing too. There could be the element of friendship. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between watching a sport where you really understand the sport well and what goes into making something excellent? and just sort of showing up and turning the game on. Is there a difference in pleasure that comes with that? Yes? Think so? What, what's that like? What would that be like for sports? Like if you're, you're going to watch the Super Bowl and really get a lot out of it, what preconditions would, would have to be there? You'd have to know about how you know, the rules of the game and, and you know, if you really want to get a lot You'd have to understand strategy. Why are they calling a timeout now? I mean, a lot of the things that they do in football um, would, to an outsider who hasn't been watching the game for a while, would be totally incomprehensible, wouldn't they? Yeah. Distinctively human side more than just our pure animal side. I mean, animals like to watch things run around. Cats like to watch, you know, birds fly around, mainly because they, they, they imagine themselves, I think, going out and eating them. Um, and um, little, little children, babies, you know, motion attracts them. You give them toys to play with that make noise or rattle or that, you know, spin and they have to touch and things like that. But watching sports goes beyond that. I'm not saying that John Stuart Mill would say that this is actually you know, a super high pleasure. He probably would still say, you know, reading and cultivating your mind is always to be preferred than to watching the game. But I think that we could actually see some aspects of watching the game, depending on how you do it, would engage your higher faculties. What about playing sports? Maybe that's more of a just sheer, sheer bodily thing. What do you think? How many of you have played any sort of sport during middle school, high school, or, or college uh, on some sort of team? Oh, just everybody, okay, just about. Why would I be wrong then to say, ah, you were just, you know, moving your body around, <coughs> and you like moving your body around, and that feels kind of good? What else did you get out of it? Those of you who did, maybe some of you hated it. What else did you get out of it um, that made that pleasurable for you? Yeah. Do with competition and winning. Okay, winning. Um, that might just be appealing to animal, sort of our animal side though too. The dogs will roll each other over and you know fight with each other. Um, I know that when I was in this one, I played soccer. I was with most of my friends who were in my class, mm -hmm. and so I enjoyed spending like more time outside of school with them playing on the team. 
Okay, so again, it has to do with um, something like friendship. Maybe, maybe companionship would be a better word, but we like being with other people who we share a common pursuit with and we can talk with about that sort of thing. Okay, that's interesting. So, improvement. That would be distinctively you. There, there aren't any animals that measure themselves against standards and say, here's what I want to achieve, here's what I need to do in order to get there, let me you know, do it step by step by step. We do that. And when we do that, we feel a kind of sense of pride, accomplishment. Um, that's a pleasure, a higher pleasure for us, and Mill would say an extremely important pleasure. Uh, an ideal judge, somebody who's a good you know, uh, judge between these kinds of pleasures, is always going to take the higher pleasure over the lower pleasure, and will, because they appreciate them more. Um, so think about all these, and think about other kinds of pleasures and pains that, that we have. The real test is what you would sacrifice against what, what how you would rank these pleasures. We might be able to take some of these and add things to them, and thereby make them yet higher pleasures. For instance, the watching sports. Um, so a lot of us do like watching sports. Or let's say it's not necessarily sports. What are other things that we watch that we can take enjoyment in? What else do you guys put when you're clicking through the channels? More than that, you guys watch TV, right? What else do you watch? Yeah. Sitcoms and stuff. Okay, comedy. Uh, that, that, that's a good example right there. Any of you watch movies? Do you like musical performances? Do you ever go to concerts? Listen to things? I'm willing to bet you listen to a lot of stuff. I'm willing to bet that some of you have <coughs> um, headphones and, and an iPod or you know, a phone that, that you've got music loaded onto with you right now. Um, what are you getting out of it? Think about at the very low level, you know, maybe you just like action movies because things get blown up and you like explosions. You know, and you get a kick out of them. That's not bad. That's probably a lower pleasure than appreciating the interactions between human beings in a drama or um, thinking about, you know, funny situations and what makes them funny. Um, now imagine on a sort, sort of higher level, you've actually been involved in <coughs> this sort of thing. So when you're listening to music, I remember for myself, for example, um, I, I learned to play bass when I was in the Army. And one of the things that that did for me is it made me appreciate some bands a lot more. And it also made me appreciate some bands a lot less. Up until that time, I really, really liked ACDC. And I still do like ACDC. But I came to realize, after playing bass a while, <coughs> just how simple ACDC songs are. And that I could basically, you can actually play chords on bass if you, if you do it right. But I could play all these things, because these were three chord songs. And it you know, could do it just like that. Um, there were other bands where, because I had that, that experience, I could say, wow, that person is really phenomenally good, way, you know, way beyond me. And I could appreciate it, I could feel pleasure in it. Uh, that opened up sort of a door for me. And why was that possible? Because I cultivated a higher faculty. To learn how to play something is not just, you know, picking it up and moving your fingers, right? It's cultivating your mind. If you want to play baseball, you have to learn some music theory. Um, that's doing some mental gymnastics. Uh, what about sports? Do you think it's the same for somebody who's never played a sport to watch that as somebody who has played that sport? Probably not, right? What about the people who are the commentators? You know, if we take football, for example, because that's the sport I, I know the best. Um, those guys who, you know, they're all, you know, in suits and they're, they're analyzing it on Monday night. Why are they there? What, what got them in the door? Yeah. Usually they're like ex-players or ex-coaches. Yeah. They know it inside and out. 
And presumably, they actually enjoy doing that. It's not just a way to make money. And they have been <coughs> thinking about these things for years and years and years. Why do we like to, to watch them and listen to them? Because, you know, maybe, maybe if we don't, then we should just get them off and say, shut up, you, you, you know, bunch of morons. Let's watch the game. But we don't think that they're morons. We want to hear what they have to say because they actually add to our appreciation for the game. When it comes to movies, if you actually like what movie critics have to say, if that if learning about you know the ins and outs of a movie improves your appreciation of that movie, you've now moved from a fairly high level of pleasure to yet a higher level of pleasure. And again, Mill's test for this is <coughs> what would an ideal judge say? Would they, if they were given the choice, okay, watch a movie and have everybody shut up, you know, don't tell you anything about the movie, and then afterwards, stay shut up, or watch the movie and then have somebody who's knowledgeable about, you know, that director and what they were doing and why they filmed things this way and why the narrative goes like that, tell you about all those things. This is a higher pleasure. And if you're a good judge of those kinds of pleasures, you will take that higher pleasure in preference to the lower pleasure every single time. Um, same thing with food. Once you come to appreciate good food, let's take, you know, a, a I guess it's probably a qualitative difference. Um, think about fast food. McDonald's, Burger King, you know, all that sort of stuff. Once you actually start eating better food, it's harder to go back and eat McDonald's food. It doesn't taste right. I remember the experience for myself. I, I, like, I liked Burger King a lot. And then I started cooking for myself a lot more. Um, and I could make things healthier, better, you know, more savory and all that. And then to go back to a Burger King meal, it's, it's, it's just not satisfying anymore. Um, now, imagine the next step. That's all still sort of physical pleasure. Now you take a gastronomy class and you learn about the history of that meal that you're, you're eating. And you learn about why it was um, set up that way. Who came up with that recipe? What the variations were? How people actually got angry or excited or upset or envious mm -hmm. over this dish. Which you can, you know, if you go up to the culinary and take classes, you will find out that food has this immense rich history. Now that plate is put in front of you, and you have all these associations, and they start hitting home with you. So when you're eating that, you're not just tasting something, you're thinking about it, right? That's a higher pleasure than just the eating. And Mill says, again, the ideal judge, the person who knows both of those pleasures, they're going to pick that higher pleasure, and they'll pick any amount of that higher pleasure over any amount of that lower pleasure. So 30 meals at McDonald's versus one uh, excellent meal carried out by, by a guide at the culinary, if you actually know the difference between those two kinds of meals, and you're a good judge of that, you will pick the culinary meal as opposed to 30 or 100 or a lifetime supply of McDonald's. So that's, that's where we'll leave off.